hemorrhagic strokes. I broke it up into two separate lectures because I know it's very difficult when people are, uh, are trying to listen to these, uh, these virtual presentations and to keep people's interest. So I, I sort of made it two 25 minute lectures instead of uh, one um, hour long lecture. I apologize, I'm having some issues with my, my video here today. I'm not sure what happened with that, but uh, unfortunately won't be able to see me, but, but I nonetheless talk with you guys. If you have any questions, certainly let me know. And thanks again, Shelly, for asking me to, uh, to lecture. I would have loved to have been there in person and meet you guys. It is I feel better to be interactive and such, but with the electronics, we can do some interactive uh, component to this. All right, so let's get started. Ischemic strokes, very devastating disease. It's the leading cause of disability for patients uh, related to a medical disease. And it oftentimes can be fatal. And now, can we make a difference? We can make a difference. So I'm gonna talk about you know, what the definition is. It's really an acute obstruction or blockage or lack of blood flow to an area of the brain. And some people would extend that to the eye or the spine. Some of the things will be obvious, like this, this uh, fracture of a spine, somebody uh, who fell out of a tree, uh, unfortunately uh, acquired. Um, some of them will be very subtle as far as trying to determine when the patient has a stroke. So there's a lot of things that go into determining if the patient has a stroke uh, based on your, your physical, your history, and then you're going to want to do some imaging. We'll talk about the different imaging. And based on that, um, we'll talk about treatments because as you could guess, many of these things unfortunately go together. So based on what your images are telling you is, is the subsequent treatment that you're gonna, um, that that patient may acquire. Okay, so patients that present with strokes can present in a variety of different ways. You guys know this, this is a thing that we, I used to like in medical school, the homunculus tells you the different areas of the brain that are being affected. The anterior circulation does most of the lower leg and the middle cerebral circulation almost does the vast majority of everything else other than sort of posture and uh, coordination, which is the posterior circulation. Uh, the vast majority of strokes will be your middle cerebral circulation. It's about 80 to 85% of the strokes are that. Um, but they can present in a variety of different ways. They can present with visual problems, headaches, they can present with balance issues. So you can imagine any area of the brain can be affected by this. So you can get a multitude of different effects from it. So making the diagnosis can be very difficult on top of it there are uh, things that can mimic strokes. The sudden nature, it doesn't always have to happen. It can be gradual and onset. And there's also things called TIAs, which is a, a transit ischemic attack, which is sort of a mini stroke, or it's a, it's a temporary neurologic deficit where you do not find any signs of ischemia on any kind of imaging that you do. I remember the first patient I gave TPA to resolved within minutes after getting the medication. I was so excited, I, I made a difference. I fixed this person with thrombolytics and my program director at the time said, um, that was probably just a, a TIA and that the NINS trial, which is the only positive trial, only showed a positive effect in three months after the treatment from getting the TPA. And actually he was right. The 24 hour treatment arm did not show improvement in this. So TIA can be resemble a stroke, but ultimately those patients are gonna get better within the, the next couple of hours. From onset and not have any kind of um, deficit noted on uh, advanced imaging. So I always just like to start with the case. This is a 76 year old male. He's having difficulty speaking. And this is actually a true case. That's my father in law. This happened about three or four years ago. My wife and I were out of the state at a conference and he had called and he had an expressive aphasia. And he realized that this was going on. Um, so we, tried to convince him to go to the emergency room, but he did not. We had the neighbors go to his house and after about two hours, his symptoms resolved. So this may not be the ideal patient. I don't recommend not going to the hospital when somebody's having a neurologic event like this because there are treatments that can be rendered. Uh, but nonetheless, this is the case of my father-in-law and what we did for him as far as what treatments are out there, what imaging should be done. And like I said, he did not go to the emergency room, but if he did go to the emergency room, he would have gotten certainly much more expedited care than he did doing uh, his workup as an outpatient. 
So the first thing that you're going to want to determine when a patient comes in, is this an ischemic event? Is it a blocked blood vessel that's causing a problem? Or is it a hemorrhagic event? It did the blood vessel break and that's prohibiting blood from getting to the area that you're having the issue with. Um, this lecture is going to be talking about the ischemic ones. We're not going to talk about the hemorrhagic ones. Um, the treatment is vastly different, as you can imagine, with the hemorrhagic strokes, but we'll talk about that in our, ne our next lecture. We're gonna, so we'll talk about ischemia. Uh, one important thing is that you cannot distinguish the two of these based on your physical exam and your history. Um, sometimes people will present with headaches, sometimes it'll be sudden, sometimes it'll be staggered. These things do not really determine if it is ischemic stroke or a hemorrhagic stroke. You have to um, do imaging. The imaging modality choice, this is our CAT scan machine at Morristown uh, Medical Center, and we call it the circle of truth. A lot of patients will go through this, and uh, you're going to want to do a simple non-contrast CT of the head. And really, in an acute stroke, what you're looking for is other disease process. Does the patient have a tumor there? Are there signs of the patient having MS, or does the patient have a bleed? You want to really see that there's not another active pathological process going on there. Um, and if you do not see any of those and you have a normal CAT scan, those are the patients that will be considered uh, being acutely treated with the, the one medication that we have that's FDA approved, which is the thrombolytics, the super clot busting medication. So what we're looking for is a normal CAT scan and those are the patients that would be candidates for uh, thrombolytics, so that super clot busting medication. So this is a picture of a, a CAT scan. Um, it's not a normal CAT scan. Uh, this side of the brain is, is normal. So what is this white area here? That's uh, calcification of the choroid plexus. That's where the cerebral spinal fluid is made up. That's a normal finding. This is the sylvian fissure here. Uh, this actually, this white area is a dense MCA sign. So a dense middle cerebral artery. Uh, this means basically there's a clot within the vessel. And this was a patient I had had. This is indicative of poor prognostic outcome, usually means severe disease. But in general, you're going to see a normal brain in the patient that you want to treat with thrombolytics. And, and in this case, if you do see an MCA sign, that's still, that's not an exclusion for thrombolytics and it might uh, you know, certainly benefit this patient. So non-contrast CT is the study of choice initially when somebody comes in. Certain cases, you're going to have to do advanced imaging. This is a, a patient I had had that had an MRI done. Um, this is a delayed presentation of somebody with a stroke. And there's a small area of infarct in the medullary area. It's a lateral medullary infarct or Wallenberg syndrome. This patient presented with dizziness um, to an urgent care center and was treated as a sinus infection, but it turned out that the patient had had a stroke. If this patient had come to the emergency room as within the three to four and a half hour window before that time, he probably would have been a good candidate for uh, thrombolytics, because posterior fossa uh, infarcts actually do fairly well uh, with the thrombolytics. This patient, unfortunately, uh, presented with vertigo, um, and he came back to the emergency room a couple weeks after this initial event with continued vertigo. So uh, I can imagine having persistent vertigo symptoms as, as uh, symptomatology. Can you imagine the quality of life that this person has now with continued episodes of spinning, nauseousness, and having to live like that? Okay, new guidelines just came out less than a year ago. The American Heart Association makes some recommendations. I, I recommend taking a look at this, and we're going to touch uh, on some of this, and they go through the levels of evidence. So it's actually a fairly extensive paper. It's, it's like 60 pages, and it was just recently published. So if you want to take a look at this, I think it's got some inform interesting information there and it summarizes a lot of the stuff that I'm actually going to be talking about uh, later. So in general, when somebody comes in with a stroke, the only acute treatment we have that's FDA approved is thrombolytics. So this is the medication we're concerned about giving these patients. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. I'm going to talk about the two, there's only been two positive studies. Uh, looking at using thrombolytics, and we're going to talk about those studies and some of the limitations. Now, people say in emergency medicine, there's two kinds of physicians, those that believe in thrombolytics and those that don't believe in thrombolytics. And actually, I think I'm sort of middle of the road, but if it's me and I'm within the window of, of getting the thrombolytics, I think I would 
I would probably get the thrombolytics and be in favor of it. So, so it was certainly something that I do believe in. Um, antiplatelet medication really is preventing future strokes from happening, starting the aspirin. Talk briefly about this. Um, this is more preventative, it needs to be done within the first you know, 48 hours or so. Blood pressure is, is highly controversial. Most people feel that you can allow permissive hypertension in these patients because as you, if you imagine, this is a hose and the hose is, is very narrowed where the, where the area of the stroke is. So if you're actually decreasing the amount of pressure in that hose, you're gonna decrease the amount of blood flow through that area and you may uh, precipitate worsening outcomes in those patients. So, so it is a controversial area. Um, if you're not giving thrombolytics, people allow the blood pressure to be quite high. We're talking like 220 over 120. If it's above that, you're probably going to want to reduce it. But those patients that are getting thrombolytics, we have to reduce their blood pressure because those patients are at risk for bleeding if their blood pressure is high. And I think actually one of the new uh, modalities to treat these patients actually is with surgery. And I, actually, I think a lot of the, the information I'm going to be talking about is, is the newer imaging that they, they've used and maybe what the future holds for uh, treating these patients. All right, so I wanna talk about the NINS trial. This is the National Institute of Neurologic Disorder Study. This was done in 1995. So it's actually 25 years old now, and it still holds to the test of time as being showing that thrombolytics are uh, beneficial to patients. Now, they just looked at patients um, less than three hours from onset, and they had to have a significant deficit on on the NIH, or National Institute of Health Stroke Scale, which is a scale that they devised, it's zero to 42 points. And if they had some sort of clinical deficit and they presented within three hours and essentially had a normal CAT scan, then they would enroll them in the study. Now, there were a lot of patients that were excluded and I'm not gonna go through all this exclusion criteria because it's fairly extensive. And most people recommend that you should have a checklist of these exclusion criteria because there are so many of them. But the one that we really have to deal with a lot is this blood pressure, 185 over 100 is, is the upper limits of being able to treat these patients because often these patients will present to the emergency room, not only with their stroke, but they will be hypertensive at that time. So um, you're going to have to treat that, get that blood pressure below the threshold if you want to give that patient thrombolytics. I was just talking briefly more about the, the NINJ trial. There were two arms to the NINJ trial. There was one arm that looked at 24 hour outcomes and there was a second arm that looked at three month outcomes. And like I had said, when I, my uh, residency director had told me that, you know, because the patient improved immediately, this probably wasn't the effects of the thrombolytics, it was probably a TIA. It was based on this because at 24 hours, there was no significant difference in patient's outcomes. Uh, it was only at, three months that these patients showed a benefit. And how they determine um, clinically how they're doing at outcome, and this is something you'll see, which is a little bit painful, is this modified ranking score. It's a scale uh, from zero to six. Zero meaning they're totally normal, six meaning that they are dead. Uh, so six is really bad. So a modified ranking scale zero to one is just a very subtle defect. Most people would say zero to two, so less than two or less, you, you can still live independently. And nonetheless, the, uh, using this scale, the uh, NINS trial found that it needed, a number needed to treat. So you, for every eight patients you treated, um, one person improved and had an improvement in their, their modified ranking scale. Uh, this study has been continued to be reanalyzed because uh, just by random chance, it turns out that, that the arms were not exactly even um, as far as the severity of disease and, and other um, confounding factors. Like I said, it, this study unfortunately didn't have a large number of patients with, with very mild strokes. And the ones that had very mild strokes were actually predominantly in the thrombolytic arm. So this they think could have made it so that there was a significant improvement in the thrombolytics just based on this randomization that, that unfortunately did not make them exactly even. It's one of the problems, unfortunately, with a randomized control trial, you don't have, you can't control for this. Um, so there have been multiple reanalysis re of this study trying to uh, adjust for that. 
Um, the biggest side effect of giving thrombolytics, and we'll talk a little bit about this in the, in the next couple slides, is intracranial hemorrhage. 7% of those patients um, that got the thrombolytics, got that clot busting medication, had an intracranial bleed. So, so that's fairly significant. That's just not any intracranial bleed. That's actually, they have to have a bleed and uh, a two point drop in their um, severity score on the NIA stroke scale. So they're pre it's pretty significant bleeds that those patients have. And there was no difference in mortality whether you got the thrombolytics or not. In general, the sooner or the earlier that you got the thrombolytics, the better off you were and the better that you did. Okay, this is the, that's ranking scale, just showing the placebo arm. 26% did this, did very well with placebo and 39% actually did very well with getting the thrombolytics and TPS. So this just shows you uh, the larger amount of people that, that did better was predominantly in the, the TPA arm. Um, this is the second study, the ECAS-3 trial. This is a European um, cooperative acute stroke study. Uh, and all they did was they, they used the NINS trial um, study a protocol. Then they, they sort of limited it to a little bit lower risk patients. And then they extended the window from three to 4.5 hours. Actually, they only enroll patients from three to 4.0 hours. If they, they were uh, before the three hours, they just got treated as any other uh, patient with the thrombolytics. Um, it's sort of interesting. They had enrolled almost 800 patients. And this study showed you need to treat about 14 patients um, to improve one in outcome. Now, this is it's a class two trial, means it wasn't quite as good as, as the NINJ trials as far as its outcome. But I think it's sort of interesting is this is fragility index. And it's just you know, a simple way of saying if you changed a good outcome from one, uh, from the from the treatment arm to the placebo arm, how many people would you have to change to make this study not statistically significant? So in the NINJ trial, if you switched three people that had a good outcome from the TPA arm to the placebo arm, that would make that trial not statistically significant, which is say that doesn't seem like that much. Unfortunately, the ECAS trial um, if you moved one patient from the treatment arm that had a good outcome to the placebo arm, that trial would not be statistically significant. So it's a, uh, you know, an interesting thought, but these are the two trials that have been constantly sort of reanalyzed and they're the only two positive trials using thrombolytics. And uh, because of these two, we basically will treat all stroke patients that present with four, within four and a half hours with thrombolytics, but it is a uh, highly controversial topic. They, like I said, they, they were a little bit more stringent on who they enrolled in these trials. If the patients was greater than, than 80 years old, if they had a more severe um, stroke scale number, it was higher, it was the worst that you do. So the number was over 25, they excluded you. Or if you've had prior strokes and diabetes, or you're on any kind of blood thinners, they excluded those patients also. So the higher risk patients were excluded of, of the, in this trial, which is certainly understandable. And this is just the outcomes and, and I, the modified ranking scale, which we talked about, so zero to one. So these are very mild deficits. Large number of patients, as 55% of the patients actually had very good outcomes. Now, like I said, they excluded the, the more severe stroke patients. Um, in this study. So actually their outcomes were a little bit better even than the NENS trial, as far as the numbers or percents of people that had this, this very mild uh, ranking score. And it was 54 for, or 55 for those that got the TPA versus 45 uh, that was in the placebo one, which was statistically significant. Um, this is, uh, like we said, the most common side effect, whenever you give a medication, you always have to weigh the risks versus the benefits. Uh, the risk of this uh, giving thrombolytics is primarily intracranial hemorrhage, uh, bleeding in the head. And you can see the ECAS-3 trial is, is here. This one here had about a 2.4% uh, risk, so not so high. And then the NINJ trial had a 7.9%. So the risk is about eight, somewhere between two and 8% of bleeding in your head that is significant 
uh, to cause you to have measurable deficits from this bleed. But if you look at any intracranial hemorrhage, which you know you probably should when you're giving this medication, tell people the risk factors involved with it was up to 27%. So about a third of these patients that are given uh, TPA will be having um, intracranial hemorrhages. The majority of those will not be symptomatic from it. You can imagine the new imaging modalities and the MRIs are super sensitive for picking up these micro hemorrhages. So, so a lot of these patients will hemorrhage. They won't be statistically uh, or make a significant change though in their, in their mental status. This I just thought was interesting. This was uh, from a couple weeks ago and the uh, ASEP newsletter that they put out and they just reanalyzed their, uh, analyzed all the studies looking at thrombolytics and acute strokes. And then the two trials, the NINS2, the NINS1 was looking 24 hours, the NINS2 was the one looking at three months. And you see there's an asterisk here and the ECAS3 trial is also an asterisk here. They basically said that they reanalyzed that data uh, looking at the severity of disease and the randomization. And they basically said that there was no difference in any of these um, studies when they reanalyzed the data based on um, you know, the severity of the disease. So, so it's still certainly a controversial topic. Um, here in the United States, we certainly do treat the patients up to four and a half hours with thrombolytics. You know, it's a risk benefit ratio. We let them know certainly when they're uh, you know, over three hours to four and a half hours that this is not a, sort of an off-label use of the TPA. Um, so we usually have them sign consent and, and give them a risk benefit ratio and then have, you know, decision-making um, collectively with the patients. I think this is a, a, an important slide. So those patients that come in with, with an acute ischemic stroke, we want to decide which patients will be a candidate for the thrombolytics. And the way we're going to do that is non-contrast CT. So this is really the best you know, first branch off, we're gonna get a non-contrast CT. If the patient presents after four and a half hours, then they're no longer a candidate this time for thrombolytics. And we're gonna to have to do some advanced imaging, uh, imaging such as CT perfusions, CTAs, to determine if there's a large vessel that's being included there and to see if there is reversible areas of ischemia, like penumbra. Um, so there's now, new imaging modalities, which gives us more information on the brain tissue and whether we have a chance to, for that tissue to recover um, based on what the imaging shows. So within four and a half hours, you, you treat with non-contrast CT and thrombolytics. After four and a half hours, or if you're contraindicated for a reason, forget into thrombolytics, you're gonna to wanna to do advanced imaging, such as a CTA, see if there's a large vessel that's occluded, and you might want to additionally do some further uh, perfusion studies to tell you how viable that tissue is there. And a lot of these patients will be candidates for uh, thrombectomy, getting that clot removed mechanically uh, from that area. Uh, this is a, a picture of a CTA of a patient I had that had a, a large basal or artery aneurysm. Um, this contrast in here, and actually this is all clot within the basal artery. This patient presented to the emergency room with dizziness. Uh, they got a non-contrast CT. It didn't show anything. The patient was actually ultimately sent home and then came back with their, their large stroke a couple hours later and had the most feared complication was a locked-in syndrome. Uh, so devastating disease illness. And actually they, they gave the patient thrombolytics because he came back, his symptoms had re restarted, but unfortunately did not have a good outcome. So some patients you're gonna to wanna to do advanced imaging on CT angiograms if they're certainly not within that four and a half hour window uh, because you might uh, be able to treat these patients with uh, surgery. Okay, these are some of the fancy perfusion studies. These are the studies that are gonna help us determine is that tissue still viable? If the tissue's dead, then going to surgery is not gonna help them. But if the tissue is still viable, then those patients would benefit from getting the embolectomy. So you see that there's a large area of the middle cerebral circulation that's being affected, but the cerebral blood flow is actually still good there. So, so this patient might benefit. And there's a lot of things that come in into part in deciding this, such as the collateral circulation that the patient has. So, so not everybody's time frame is the same as far as how long it takes for damage to occur. This is a, 
this is a review of the, the interventional studies and I have them sort of up top here is, is, is all the names of all the different studies. And um, this basically, I think brings home the point that the window of the therapeutics can be extended in a lot of these patients. And a lot of these patients, if you look at the, the ranking scale of how they did their outcomes, were actually fairly significant. This is 78% of these patients actually had a good outcome and you're talking about six hour window. So what I think this brings home is that when we're trying to decide what treatment to administer to these patients, time might not be the best perimeter as far as deciding. So we have to sort of do that with thrombolytics, but not all patients are the same. And some patients will have viable tissue um, longer and others may not. So, so I think the way of the future is doing these advanced imaging modalities and we might be able to even extend the window of thrombolytics if we see that these patients have a penumbra that's large and, and not a large core, which is, which is already dead. But for right now, we have not extended that window. We're not doing the advanced imaging on these patients outside the window, but they are doing those studies for endovascular uh, treatment. And this is a further thing, look at the, the DAWN trial actually extends up to 24 hours. So you can treat these patients for an extended period of time. Uh, I think this is sort of interesting. If the patient comes in within the four and a half hour window, we give them the thrombolytics now. And if they don't improve and they have large vessel disease on advanced imaging, then those patients actually will go for embolactinase. But, but now patients that present with strokes within 24 hours, we are contacting our interventional uh, neurosurgeons and we're getting advanced imaging on these patients because they might benefit from, from embolactomy if they have a, a large area of reversible penumbra based on your advanced imaging. This is what it looks like. This is a digital subtraction angiography, which is basically an angiogram. Um, you can see here the vessels coming up and then there's, there's a clot here. So you see no blood getting past that. Uh, this is one of the extraction techniques that they use sort of like a a net that they pull the clot out with. They can also inject thrombolytics into the area to, to break up the clot. And you can see this nice, nice circulation that's, that's been uh, uh, restored here. And this is what the clot looks like when it was taken out. And you can see it's almost a couple inches in, uh, in length. So um, this is how they, one of the means with which they, they take those clots out. Um, I just want to touch base on, on dual antiplatelet therapy. I know we looked at or Barney talked about the forest plots, I'm not a huge research person. I know you know, sort of make this sort of simple. There were a lot of different studies that, that looked at this and most of them crossed the, the line, uh, this, this uh, the vertical line here, which means they were not statistically significant. But when you put all these studies together here, and I, you have a, you know, almost, almost 14,000 patients, you see that the cumulative effect is that it probably is beneficial to use dual antiplatelet medications in patients with a stroke. But like I said, this doesn't have to be started um, emergently in the, uh, in the emergency room. It can be uh, delayed 24 to 48 hours afterwards. And this really prevents further strokes from happening. Uh, the blood pressure, like I said, is highly controversial if the patient is going to be getting thrombolytics because of the that NINS trial that we spoke about, the only positive trial, we really got to get the blood pressure below 185 over 110. And there's a, a slew of different medications that you can use. Uh, most people will give labetalol, which, which is a beta blocker, or nicardipine, which is a calcium channel blocker. Those are the, the ones that are most often administered. If the patient is not a candidate for thrombolytics, they may want to allow that increased blood pressure, their permissive hypertension, because like I said, there's a narrowing in the hose. If you're reducing the amount of force in that hose, you might make that stroke even worse because then less blood will get through that, that area of stricture or narrowing. Now, another thing that should be considered in these patients is endarterectomy of the carotid. So when we do the angiogram, we don't only look at the brain, we look at the neck and make sure that there's not a reversible uh, process going on there. And it turns out in about 30% of patients there will be. And if it's greater than 70%, then those patients should uh, get an embolectomy. Now, this is what the sort of the clot looks like here, the narrowing of the carotid. This is on a Doppler 
And then just looking at multiple studies, and this is five-year outcomes in symptomatic stroke patients, you can see that the risk of stroke and the risk of death is significantly better in those patients that are treated with carotid endarterectomies um, first medical treatment. So they have that, they should be get their carotids cleaned out. Some people, CAS is now they put stents in there. It's a fancy way of now. So you don't have to actually go in there mechanically and remove the clot. You can do it via stenting. And most of the, the organizations that monitor it say you can do either, either way. So let's go back to my case. This is uh, my, my father-in-law. He did have bilateral strokes on his uh, CAT scan. Uh, they did a, car a cardiac workup because they thought it was maybe an embolic. It was embolic, but it was coming from his carotid. He had bilateral plaque. This is actually the plaque here because he's right hand dominant. His left side of his brain is being affected. So this is the one and you can see how tight that area is here. Because uh, he was home, obviously he did not get TPA, but we did give him antiplatelet medication, aspirin and Plavix, we put him on cholesterol medication. And we did not lower his blood pressure because you can imagine getting blood through this area, if you lowered blood pressure, may not improve his outcome. And then he actually had a successful uh, carotid and arterectomy and had a good outcome. So conclusion, before four and a half hours, thrombolytics, after a negative CAT scan, after four and a half hours, you're gonna to wanna to do advanced imaging to find out if it's large vessel disease and if there's a reversible area there, penumbra that you can really help. I think that's the way the future and um, you know, endovascular uh, after four and a half hours. Dual antiplatelets are probably effective, don't have to be started in the emergency room. Blood pressure is controversial. If you're given thrombolytics, you gotta give the uh, blood pressure medication. If you're not, then you allow the permissive hypertension and then ultimately surgery. So awesome. I got a couple I, questions. I got it, Fred, I'm gonna pull it up. Okay. Because then we can make it interactive, they can answer it. Okay, there we go. So. Everyone has the link, um, so go to this and answer the question. The initial study of choice within three hours for, from onset of stroke, what would be the, the best study? Oh, well, that was perfect. Everyone did an awesome job. Yeah, but the CT without contrast is your study of choice. So that's, uh, that would be B. I'll pull up next question. Here's the answer, and here we go. TPA has the best results of given within blank hours from the onset according to the NINS trial. So this is sort of a tricky question. So you wanna give it within the NINS trial. So the ECHAS trial showed the three to three and a half hour window. So one of the reoccurring themes that I want to take home here is the best results is the sooner you give it. So if both two and three hours are, are acceptable within the NINS trial, but the sooner you give it within, within the two hours, you're better off. So the shorter time, so it's two hours for that one. Sort of a trick question. And now as far as giving TPA, what should the blood pressure systolically be under? It looks like most people have uh, had the right answer there. All right, perfect. I'm just gonna switch to the next little uh, lecture here and um, just pull this up. Hopefully I don't screw something up here. You just have to share your screen. Yeah, just gonna, uh, oh, I have to share it? Yep, you just have to reshare your screen. Okay. Because when I take over control, I kick okay. you out. <laughs> okay. You see it? Yep, we see it. To start presentation, you're good. Okay, perfect. So now we're going to talk a little bit about a different kind of stroke. This is the intracranial hemorrhage, and this is the most devastating kind of stroke that we have. And I think there's ways of treating these patients in the emergency room. Uh, treating them aggressively, you can make a significant difference. So this is a typical one day in the emergency room. So I like talking about cases. This is a, a 90 year old patient that came in with a, a bleed inside their head unresponsive. Another 40 year old patient that came in with a, a different kind of bleed. It's a subarachnoid bleed. And then a third patient that came in with a small bleed in the uh, 
the, the brain stem area. So three different bleeds, as you can imagine, that these patients are all have to be treated, but treated in a different, different manner. So not all bleeds are the same. So we'll talk a little bit about the evaluation, we'll talk again about the blood pressure, different medications we can use. Um, I'm not gonna talk about much about you know, how to reverse anticoagulation, but more so of who do you reverse the anticoagulation in? And then we'll talk about, again, about surgery if all else fails. Uh, this is a beautiful Jersey Shore here, a picture of it. Thought I'd just bring a, a nice little beautiful day, beautiful picture in there. Uh, numbers, over a million people a year suffer from intracranial hemorrhage and it is the deadliest form of strokes. The most common risk factor for this is hypertension. And with these improved uh, imaging modalities, we actually have improved ways of treating them. And as with the ischemic stroke, the, the key to treating these patients is making an early diagnosis and treating them aggressively. Not all strokes are, are the same. The Pudamin is the one up uh, in, labeled A there is the most common one. Uh, I guess my pointer is not really working right now. So, but you can see that top left corner is the putamen. The bottom middle E is a cerebellar infarct. That's in a small contained box essentially in the posterior fossa. That that's a surgical, uh, surgical repair. The one in C is is concerning because that extends into the ventricles where the CSF is, and if that clot blocks off the drainage spot, then that patient's going to have a significantly worse outcome. So not all bleeds are the same. When somebody comes in and you suspect that they have a stroke, you won't know if it's a ischemic for a hemorrhagic stroke, so you have to get a CAT scan. Now, future looks like you're probably gonna have to get some sort of advanced imaging. This is a CTA, and you can see that there's actually uh, a little white area within the middle of, of the, the hemorrhage there, and that is a, uh, that is a continued extravasation. So initial study would be non-contrast CT, but you're probably gonna wanna want do advanced imaging in these patients. So a patient comes in, intracranial hemorrhage, you're gonna to wanna to do your ABCs, you're gonna evaluate them aggressively and get them over to the CAT scan machine. Now, the first thing you'll notice, a lot of these patients will be hypertensive. It's probably even higher than 70%. Mostly it shows about 70%. And this has one of the strongest predictors of poor outcome. So it's been shown in, in hemorrhagic patients you really wanna reduce the blood pressure. And we'll talk, there's been two studies out there. The first one is actually the one that really is, had made us decide that these patients need to have a, a, a blood pressure reduced, the INTERACT-2 trial. And they looked at patients when they reduced the blood pressure to less than 140 or somewhere between 140 and 180 range with aggressive therapy. They, they used a multitude of medications. You could use whichever one you want. They didn't specify what it was. And they showed that there was an improved outcome in those patients who had a blood pressure of 140 or less. But if you treated it too much, if you got the blood pressure down to less than 130, those patients actually had a worse outcome. So they did show that those who blood pressure was lowered, um, less than 140, those patients had less hematoma growth, which we expect go along with improved clinical outcomes also. So based on this, we basically told that we treat these patients uh, to get their blood pressures less than, than 140, but not too far below that. Uh, after this, the attached two trial actually was a little bit more aggressive and a faster job of getting the blood pressure down and Actually, a lot of these patients, blood pressures were between 110 and 140 when they treated them, and they used the IV nicardipine. So it's only one medication that they used to get their blood pressure down. And they actually saw that these patients actually had a worse outcome and more renal uh, adverse effects when they reduced it rapidly and more aggressively. So, you know, there are a lot of different medications we could use to treat hypertension in patients with intracranial hemorrhages. Um, calcium channel blockers and beta blockers are, are the ones we typically think about. Uh, Labetalol is, is really the best as a non-selective uh, you know, beta blocker. So that's the one that we typically use and it could be given as boluses, which is sort of nice. You don't have to titrate it. And uh, nicardipine is the, the typical calcium channel blocker that we use. When you look at these two medications head to head, labetalol versus nicardipine, saying which one is better? Are we using both of them? Um, they basically said that nicardipine um, is probably more effective. It rapidly gets the blood pressure down as compared to labetalol, uh, but the effects are very similar. So um, the only issue with this is 
as, as was shown in the prior studies, the faster you reduce blood pressure, the patients might not do as well. So, so some people might say because levetolol is not quite as potent, maybe this blood pressure medication might work a little bit better because it's slower and these patients might do better. If you look at overall blood pressure, conservative treatment is from 140 to 180 versus aggressive treatment less than uh, 140. And this forest plot, again, you can see there really is no difference. Um, so it is conflicting evidence. There was one meta-analysis that, that looked at all of these studies and they did a subset analysis. And if the patients didn't have high blood pressure, so they had no history of it, those patients did better if the stroke was going on for a longer time or if there were less severe strokes. If those are the patients that you wanna get their blood pressures down specifically in. Otherwise, you know, 140, 150 is probably okay, but it's not too far, not too fast. You know, the devil's in the details here. So blood thinners, you know, who do we reverse these on? Um, there really are no good studies out there when I did a literature search on this. And basically it says that um, based on consensus, anybody that has an intracranial hemorrhage that's on an anticoagulant should have their anticoagulant reversed. Um, they have platelet uh, inhibitor medications. There's really no good um, treatment for this other than giving platelets or DDAVP, uh, but that should be uh, decided amongst you and the neurosurgical colleagues. Just briefly looking, and we have reversal agents for a lot of the different uh, anticoagulants, uh, warfarin, uh, the drug of choice now is this PCC, which is the prothrombin uh, complex concentrate and uh, vitamin K. We don't use FFP as much, though it is it's effective, but it can take up to 10 hours for the FFP to reverse the effects of Coumadin. Uh, the fact that 10 A inhibitors, um, such as Xeralta or um, Eloquis, we can reverse those with a Dexanet Alpha. Um, problem with that is it's very expensive, it can be up to $40,000. So it's not a drug that you just wanna throw at, at every patient. And the bigger trend is Pradaxa, we have Pradaxa bind and we can reverse that one also. So there are reversal agents. Anyone that has a bleed in their head is on an anticoagulant should be reversed. Good. And then a lot of these patients will get edema. Now this, not great studies on this, but the two medications that we can treat this with is mannitol and hypertonic saline. Um, hypertonic saline can give in multitude of doses. There is a dose you can give 23.4%, which is higher than the typical three or 2% that we give in just little aliquots of 20 to 30 cc's. Uh, but the goal is really to get that sodium level up, but this hypertonic saline should be given through a central line. It probably shows most studies that hypertonic saline is a little bit more effective than mannitol. This is just two studies showing the top one is that the patient didn't get the, uh, the hypertonic solution. The bottom one is somebody that did show much more edema. The hypertonic saline or not, and you can see actually most of the outcomes are, are worse in these patients where you have to reverse them with hypertonic saline. And this was a, a study where they just cross-referenced people with similar severity disease and ones that got hypertonic versus those that didn't get hypertonic. So not a great study, but shows that you know, sometimes these patients might not do as well, even if you treat them with the hypertonic saline. Um, those patients that had worse outcomes were those that had a higher uh, chloride levels, those that were on ventilators or those that had, uh, were on other platelet inhibiting medications. So I think this is an interesting slide. And this is not just for patients with intracranial hemorrhages. It's all coming patients with increased intracranial pressure that are uh, have transtentorial herniation. So this is your worst case scenario, your worst outcome. Uh, what we can do as far as different treatments for these patients. And if you look over in the right column, which of these are statistically significant, you can see actually propofol is a good medication because it does lower intracranial pressure. And that has been shown to be beneficial in treating patients with um, transtentorial herniation. Actually, mannitol in this study did not show improvement, but the hypertonic saline really seems to be the winner here. If you get their, their sodium levels up over 145 or you increase it with five points, both of those statistically reduced the amount of transtentorial herniation and re reversed the herniation in these patients. So this is really the emergency intervention. Somebody comes in and you, 
find out that they have an intracranial hemorrhage, you're going to want to treat their blood pressure, get it down. Labetalol is probably a better choice, but cardine is certainly an option. Um, if they're on blood thinners, like we said, you're going to want to reverse that. Um, and if you're, you don't have a central line, you can certainly consider using mannitol over the, the hypertonic saline. So it's a lot of things that you can do right there to help these patients. And if all that fails, then we're going to have to call our neurosurgical uh, colleagues to see if they can, uh, they can help us out here now. Now, trafficking or putting holes in people's skulls has been around for a long time. Certainly, um, these size holes aren't used anymore. We're doing much finer surgeries with much smaller tools, which cause a lot, lot less damage to the surrounding tissue. And this is one of the, the tools that they use to, to sort of suck out the clots. They can actually in inject saline, they can inject thrombolytics through this to break up the clot, and then they can suck out, out the clot with this tool. And they can do this under CT guidance in the OR, so they can get to a very specific area and so not causing much damage to the other surrounding tissues. Um, and those patients that have clots that extend into the ventricles, into the lateral ventricles where, where the CSF is, you can see this picture here, uh, has midline shift, it has a big uh, accumulation of the white blood in the ventricles there. These patients oftentimes will help to have a, uh, a drain put in there so you can get that blood out. And actually, a lot of times, which seems counterintuitive, through that drain, they'll inject thrombolytics, that super clot busting medication. It's like, that doesn't make sense. Why would you put super clot busting medication into somebody's head that's already bleeding? But the problem is that that, that blood in the reservoir where the CSF is, it causes a clot and it doesn't allow that the CSF to drain. So these patients' brains get swollen because of this. So they actually put drains in this area. Sometimes they'll put uh, thrombolytics in there to, to break up the clot and to allow it to drain better because these patients have a worse outcome and you might want to consider you know when you can measure the pressures in their brain if it's greater than 20 then you might want to use some hypertonic saline uh, mannitol like we said um, uh, or propofol sedation so this is that transtentorial uncle herniation where part of the brain is going into a different cavity that it should be in uh, you know this is devastating uh, process. Although sometimes people will have some component of herniation and not have any clinical signs of that. So they'll see it on imaging, but they won't have any clin clinical significant effects from it. Those patients you would not treat with uh, hypertonic saline or mannitol. It's only those patients that are symptomatic that have this going on that you're going to want to treat just because sometimes the, the treatment is worse than the disease process. Okay. Uh, Briefly, I'm not gonna go through all of these trials, but they've been doing a lot of trials recently on draining these patients' hematomas within their brain. And like I said, now that they're becoming, and the, the first one is from 2013, and the last one is actually enrolling patients right now, is when they are more select on the patients that they're doing this on and using CT guidance with these very minimally invasive techniques, they've actually shown that they are improving the outcomes in a subset of patients using surgery on patients with intracranial hematoma. So it seems like the results are very positive about surgically uh, draining uh, a select group of patients with intracranial hemorrhage. This is a patient with a large hematoma in the cerebellar area, salivary areas. It's like we said, is the posterior fossa. It's in a small, I'd like to think of a sort of a box. It pushes on some very important structures in the brainstem if they have swelling there. And there's not much room, as you can imagine, in that area uh, for swelling. So any hematoma that's larger than a couple centimeters in that area uh, should be decompressed with surgery. So odds and ends, glucose. You really want to keep the glucose between 100 and 200, but you don't want to be over aggressive because these patients can become uh, hypoglycemic and you're not going to help the patient at all if that happens. Hyperventilating the patient is only used as a, a temporizing agent because this can cause this is pretty severe um, arterial constriction and you can cause increased uh, worsening of the stroke effects. Elevating the head of the bed is, it can drop the blood, the intracranial pressure a little bit, so probably not a bad thing to do. And you wanna keep these patients at euthermic, normal thermic temperatures. You don't wanna uh, keep them uh, super cold or super hot. Uh, 
So let's talk about this, uh, this case conclusion. So it's the patient, the 90 year old patient that came in unresponsive, family made the patient palliative care, which I think was a, was a good decision. This is a 40 year old lady who came in unresponsive with a uh, uh, large subarachnoid hemorrhage. Patient did have a berry aneurysm, which got clipped, went to the OR, continued to have spasms. Actually, they continued to do angiograms with injecting of, of cardine actually into the vessels to help prevent strokes from happening. Um, she had a long hospital stay over a month and ultimately was sent to rehab after, uh, like I said, a month's stay. Uh, with some persistent neurologic deficits. And uh, this is another 90 year old patient who presented being dizzy with this uh, bleed that extended into the fourth ventricle, which theoretically should be, be put an intraventricular catheter in there so it doesn't cause a clot, but she decided she didn't want anything done and actually she did well and was discharged two days later and, uh, and a decent neurologic condition. So in conclusion, you really need to rapidly assess all stroke patients going to be doing a CAT scan initially without contrast. Many of the uh, advanced techniques will require further imaging, but when we see those patients acutely, we don't want to delay the patient's care by getting advanced imaging. So within four and a half hours, we're going to treat these patients aggressively, just get the non-contrast CT. If uh, they're not a candidate for thrombolytics, those are the patients you're going to want to extend uh, the window in treating and the way that you're gonna determine that is based on advanced imaging. I think the way of the future is that these, these imaging modalities telling you if there is reversible areas of the schema are really gonna be the, the way of the future telling us that there is um, salvageable tissue there as opposed to using a three hour or four and a half hour time actually just telling us, you know, regardless of time, it's the imaging tells us that there's an area that we can save there, let's treat those patients. I think blood pressure control in, in patients with, with strokes, you're probably gonna allow the blood pressure to be high. In patients with hemorrhages, you're gonna to wanna to reduce their blood pressure, reverse any anticoagulations if, if they have a bleed inside their head. Edema treatment's controversial, usually hypertonic saline or mannitol, and surgery is really the last stage if medical treatment doesn't work in any of these patients. So now I got questions here. All right, let me share that. It's just three quick questions. Sorry, I know that was a lot of information. Hopefully not too many people fall asleep. <laughs> All right, guys. So you guys should have the link to answer these questions. So which is the best medication to treat hypertension in a patient with an intracranial hemorrhage? So we have a lot of different ways of reducing the blood pressure, but there's really two medications that are the safest and that's gonna be calcium channel blockers and beta blockers. Hypertonic saline is only used if the patient has uh, herniation and clinical signs of herniation. So if, like we said, talking about herniation, a patient has transtentorial herniation, which treatment would be utilized first? So we're gonna hyperventilate, Use the hypertonic saline, hypothermia, or surgery. All right, that's awesome. Yeah, hypertonic saline is, and mannitol are the two treatments. If that uh, doesn't work, then surgical decompression is your next line of treatment. And which is true regarding anticoagulants and intracranial hemorrhages? Only reverse large ones. A blood pressure treatment is not required. All patients should have their anticoagulations reversed or FFP is the drug of choice to reverse Coumadin. And that is correct. You guys, they, they can't determine which patient is, uh, is gonna decompensate. So it is recommended at this time that you reverse all anticoagulants. Obviously it's gonna be a risk benefit ratio, but, but the American Neurologic Society recommends that you reverse all anticoagulants. Well, I thank you for this time. I thank you for allowing me to give you this lecture here. Hopefully.